Hello, welcome after the break. So now we go to the second case study of today's lecture, that is the trade war of uh, Trump. As you know from the news, this is a very large scale, well implemented strategy of increasing trade costs uh, to America from Europe, from of course China, also from the main trade partners like Canada and Mexico. And now the big question is, what are the consequences of this particular uh, international policy? Whether or not the, uh, the trade tariffs are going to be a backfire for US blue collar workers, the guys who are very extensively voting for uh, this gentleman here, uh, might be actually in a very bad spot after implementing this policy. Let's see what are the, the arguments, uh, what are the intuitions given by our simple models, and what are the results of you know proper economic research that tells us about that tell us about the consequences of this of those policies? But let me give you just uh, a brief background of the situation. So what we experienced in the year 2018 is an unprecedented anti-globalization effort by the U.S. president, uh, which was imposing tariffs on several types of goods including steel, aluminium, solar panels, washing machines, for example, and also a 25% tariff on $250 billion worth uh, imports of Chinese goods to the United States. And uh, here we have a nice, uh, a nice graphical ex um, um, explanation of, uh, um, of the timeline of this particular uh, imposition of tariffs from one of the NBR's working papers. And you see that uh, the value of uh, um, the import covered by, by U.S. tariffs increased significantly to $300 billion in the end of 2018. And apparently, um, economists are actually very... Uh, um, they, are, they are agreeing very well and they are in very strong consensus in terms of the economic consequences of in, uh, implementing trade tariffs with 80% out of 60 economists that were uh, uh, surveyed by Reuters um, says that uh, there will be a more harm than good from the, from the US tariffs. Not one respondent saying that uh, tariffs would benefit the world's largest economy. And it's not only the tariffs that was um, the, the action taken by the, uh, by the U.S. president. The U.S. withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership just three days after uh, Trump became the president, and they significantly changed the deal of North American Free Trade Agreement with Mexico and Canada, putting both of those countries in a pretty bad position relative to the U.S. when it comes to, to trade uh, openness. So you see, as I told you, this is a very well-prepared, large-scale um, policy implemented to make uh, America great again, apparently. So let's see what were the motives for this uh, particular policy, which were strongly underlined during the presidential campaign be uh, before the 2016 election, um, and why people voted for this, why people wanted to have this uh, actual uh, policy implemented, even though all the economists say that this is, this is something that is counterproductive and counter uh, the economic growth. First of all, trade, um, Trump wanted to decrease the huge US trade deficit. Fair enough. Secondly, he wanted to decrease enormous and increasing inequalities in income. Fair enough. Three, he wanted to stop the collapse of US heavy industry uh, and manufacturing uh, sector. Fair enough. And number four, it was the ongoing business stealing and the leakage of the US high-tech achievements, mainly to China, that also motivated this war in terms of the ex uh, exchange of goods between the US and China. Now, let us uh, try to disentangle all of those four motives for uh, implementing tariffs. And let's try to rationalize whether or not Tariffs are the best response to fight each and every of those four points which were mentioned by Donald Trump during the presidential campaign and constitute a motivation for implementing those 
uh, those uh, those trade uh, tariff measures. Okay, so let's start with the first point: huge U.S. trade deficit. I think I already showed you this graph previously in one of the in one of the slides in the in the historical perspective on the um, on the currency um, on the currency what uh, currency regimes. I guess so. If not, a brief uh, discussion what we have here. Um, so here we have a timeline from uh, 1895 till uh, more or less today. And on the y-axis, we have a percent of GDP, which indicates the trade balance of the US. And you can see there are three regimes, three main regimes of, um, of exchange rates and tariffs in the history of uh, international economics. High tariff rates until the end of the Second World War. Then the US had the highest trade surpluses. Note that the trade surpluses are in periods of war, which is which is very biased. Okay, this is due to the war uh, war production. Then, after the Second World War, uh, the IMF was created and the Bretton Woods uh, Agreement was signed by the main um, developed economies. As you remember, this fixed the nominal exchange rates of all the countries, all the developed countries in the world, to the U.S. dollar. Okay, so there were fixed exchange rates of uh, the French fr uh, uh, franc, the German mark, the Japanese yen, to US dollar. And the US dollar was the only, um, the only currency that was um, directly exchangeable to gold, okay? There was a gold parity of US dollar, and actually this was the only currency. Comparing to the situation before the Bretton Woods Agreement, all the currencies were uh, exchanged to gold, which means there were fixed exchange rates versus gold and all the all the uh, nominal currencies in all the countries. In Bretton Woods, there were fixed exchange rates across all the currencies of all the developed countries, but only the US dollar was directly exchanged to uh, gold, all right? And then in 1970 or 71, uh, there were some problems uh, regarding the Bretton Woods um, uh, system. There was this Vietnam War, uh, which increased inflation in the US. So, people, uh, so um, governments didn't want to keep U.S. dollar as the reserve currency, plus there were uh, oil shocks, and apparently the Bretton Woods Agreement came to an end. So all the um, exchange rates of all the countries, all the main countries, developed countries in the world, became flexible, floating, all right? And this is the also the period of increased international exchange across all the uh, countries. You can call it accelerated globalization with low tariff rates, all right? And apparently, you see a huge, huge, huge trade deficit of the United States generated from mid-1970s till uh, today. Trade deficit that uh, peaks at 6% of GDP in year uh, 2005, so just before the crisis uh, of subprime of 2007-2008 hits uh, the economy. And apparently, for some people, this is a big problem, and I agree. This is a problem that you should at least discuss and not disregard in terms of your macroeconomic policy analysis. Now the question is, why this trade uh, deficit uh, appears? Before answering this question, let us first consider uh, the, um, uh, the, um, the partner, um, the division of this trade deficit by trading partners. And you see that almost half of the trade deficit which is uh, 350 billion US dollars, is due to China. That is why there is no surprise that uh, President Trump, who wanted to fight the trade deficit, increased significantly tariffs on Chinese imports uh, to the US, uh, or Chinese exports to the US, that is US imports from China, all right? Therefore, uh, this, is, this is the strategy that he implemented. Then on the second place, you have Germany, then Japan, Mexico, Canada, and so on. Other countries with, whom, with which uh, Trump was also uh, fighting in terms of uh, tariffs. But now the big question is, why we observe this huge trade uh, deficit just after floating the um, uh, nominal exchange rates and decreasing the tariff rates? As we discussed in this lecture about the balance of payments, you know what happens. Uh, what happened in the 1970s after the collapse of Bretton Woods is that 
Well, the, the world needed a currency that is the general mean of exchange in the international context. And the US dollar was, used to be and was, uh, continued to be the, the main international currency. Plus, many investors all over the world want to keep safe assets, assets denominated in US dollars, assets that are issued by US uh, entities like US companies or uh, US government. Which means there is a huge demand for US denominated assets, bonds, shares, even US currency. What does it mean? From our balance of payments analysis, it simply means there is a, by definition, a current account, uh, uh, sorry, a capital account surplus, which means each year the US is selling its assets to all the, all the other countries all over the world. Well, because those, there is a demand for those assets and they are profiting from something which is called the seniorage, which means that the US dollar is uh, considered as a global um, currency, a currency in which other countries are uh, you know, making transactions. Like, I know, Philippines with Thailand is you know, exchanging goods but paying in US dollars, for, for example. So as I mentioned, by definition, this gives you a capital account surplus. Fair enough. Knowing the balance of payments, you can immediately answer what's the consequence of a capital account surplus? A current account deficit. What's the current account deficit? It's mainly the trade deficit that you can see over here, which means this trade deficit generated by the US is clearly mechanical. It is, it is caused by the fact that there are investors and other entities all over the world that want to keep US denominated, uh, US dollar denominated assets. It's not that the U.S. has a problem with productivity, productivity with you know, the production process, with the fact that they are not competitive on the, on the market. It is not, not the case, not at all the case. It is only due to the fact that there must be an accounting balance in terms of you know, how much money you, you send away to other countries and how much goods you, you, know, you get in, instead. Of course, you, you, you will get more goods than you send goods because you send more money than you get the money, all right? Therefore, you have a trade deficit and you have a capital account surplus. Voila, that's the whole explanation. Which means that the main cause of implementing trade tariffs, which motivated the, the implementation of the policy by Donald Trump, is, a, is a total, it's totally a missed shot. It's totally missing the point. I hope that it's understandable from what we analyzed throughout the course in the last weeks. Number two. Um, the, the inequality, um, the, the, the problem of inequality in terms of wages and in terms of remunerations of individuals in the United States. A very big problem, very serious problem, but a problem which is very much motivated by the capitalistic system that we have right now. Before uh, explaining this, let us have a very brief introduction into the subject. So what you see here is a, once again a timeline and a cumulative percentage change in wages, in remunerations, and in productivity over time. Once again, the line shows you the collapse of Bretton Woods system, more or less. And you see before the, this, uh, the system collapsed, the productivity and hourly compensation, which is wages, right, in general, the average wage, moved in the same direction. While when the, you know, uh, the economy is open to trade, when the uh, nominal exchange rates became flexible, you see that hourly compensation becomes, in real terms, becomes almost flat, while the productivity increased uh, significantly or continues to increase significantly. Conclusion by people who don't know how the, or, or, or have a limited uh, perception of uh, how the microeconomy works, is that, well, uh, opening up to trade and uh, freeing up the, um, the exchange rates caused workers to lose, and capitalists to win. And they as assign this collapse of, uh, you know, um, they assign this uh, divergence in productivity and hourly compensation to lower tariffs period as we have it here. And this was the argument of Donald Trump, one of the arguments of Trump, used by Trump. But actually, this is not the case. In fact, what is responsible for this particular Diver, di, uh, diver diversion of uh, productivity and uh, wages 
is not uh, ex, um, is not trade, is not international trade. Rather, it's technological progress. So let's decompose this overall wage effect over time into three groups of wages: low wage workers, middle age, middle wage workers, or middle skilled workers, and high skilled workers with very high wages. So what you can see from the 1980s till today is that actually the guys who are really hurt by this uh, dynamics of uh, dynamics of labor market in the US are the low wage workers and middle wage workers. Apparently the high wage workers, the high skill workers are gaining substantially due to um, over over the last three decades or even four decades. So how the economists uh, explain this uh, um, this unequal uh, returns to, to labor. Due to technological progress and the fact that technological progress is skilled bias, and in particular it is high skilled bias. What does it mean? It means that high skilled workers are, on average, complements to new technology, while low skilled workers are, on average, substitutes to new technologies. I hope that you know what the words substitute and complements mean. It simply means that if you have more capital, more technology, if you are a high skilled worker, on average, you produce more with this, uh, with this, um, with this higher amount of capital or higher technology because your skills are using this, uh, are used to um, to either develop this technology or implement this technology. While if you are a low skilled worker, well, actually the robots and the machines are actually uh, substituting your work. That is the work that is has been done by low skilled workers. Previously, now it's done by capital. That is why the productivity went up, but wages went down. Now the question is, does it have something to do with international trade? And the answer is partially yes. Because, as you remember from our uh, analysis of comparative advantage of the Ricardian trade model, countries specialize in, those, uh, in exporting those goods in which they have comparative advantage. They are relatively more productive. In which goods are the U.S. more productive? We already said this a week ago. In the high-skill intensive goods, technologically intensive goods, also capital intensive goods. And this means that U.S. is going to, uh, to export those goods which are intensive in high skills and in capital and productivity, which means opening to trade even widens the gap between high-skilled workers and low-skilled workers. Between, because, as you know from the Heckscher and Olin model, as you know from the Heckscher Olin theorem and the Rybczynski theorem, uh, the uh, the country in which uh, the the factors in which country is relatively more abundant um, are winning from opening the trade. This is the Heckscher Olin theorem, and this is exactly what we can see uh, here. But the question is, what's the counterfactual? What would be the situation if there was no international trade, if the tariffs were infinitely large all over the place? Of course, the technological progress would be slower, would be interrupted, so this would be a super negative effect of closing trade. But still, it will go on, which means that those dispersions between low and high wages would still be there, which means that trade is only a mechanism that, you know, accelerates to some extent this process, but it's not the source of the process. The source is the technological change, not openness to trade. So once again, point number two of Mr. Trump is totally missed. Maybe not totally, it's partially missed, okay? It's partially missed. Number three, point number three, the huge decrease in heavy industry and manufacturing sector in the United States. And here you can see that uh, in 1998 or 1997, uh, manufacturing constituted 16% of GDP in the US, while in 2016 it's less than 12%, let's say 11.6%. Fair enough, this is the trend in the United States. And we agree, this is maybe something concerning. But looking at the trend in the whole world, taking the, the world as a, as a total, you see this uh, gray line over here. The trend is exactly the same in the whole world as in the US. So maybe this is not a problem of, you know, being exposed to, to open trade and to competition from, you know, manufacturing from China. This is not a problem. It's simply the structural composition or the structural change in the, in the economy of the United States, which goes more into services and less into manufacturing and, 
you know, producing, uh, producing goods. But, you know, not everyone realizes this and um, having a very nicely populistic uh, argument for, you know, saving the manufacturing sector by implementing tariffs is something that is really selling well in some regions, in some among some groups of workers. That, you know, there comes this uh, prince on the white horse that is now going to save our uh, our sector, our firm, our uh, firm that is working on, you know, in a manufacturing sector, which is, as we can see, on the decline in terms of producing value added in relative terms. Now he's going to save us with tariffs. No, it's not the case. And apparently this is once again a problem of, uh, of misconception and a problem of uh, er interpreting uh, reality in a way that politicians want us to interpret the reality. As we know, once again, uh, going back to the uh, Ricardian model of trade and comparative advantage, due to the fact that manufacturing becomes comparatively disadvantaged in the US, the trade is um, less intensive in manufacturing goods. It's more intensive in high-tech goods, in, in high-tech services, in uh, goods in which uh, the US has comparative advantage. Apparently, manufacturing is, has lost a lot uh, in the last two decades, also, due to the fact that there is an that China has a comparative advantage in you know uh, in producing uh, manufacturing in the in manufacturing goods, but apparently this is a trend all over the world, and uh, you know trying to stop the structural change of the economy is something like stopping the you know technological progress. It's 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 mean uh, it's pointless. It's meaningless. Okay, so once again. An argument that is that is a bit missed by the by the politician, and the fourth argument, which was was the business stealing from uh, uh, by China from uh, U.S. Uh, companies, and uh, this is uh, a subject that goes beyond economics, of course, and uh, there are possibly some some measures to to fight this. I'm not sure if tariffs are the best measures to fight this. Do you have to quit a relation with with somebody that is you know uh, playing uh, playing um, against rules? Possibly yes, or maybe not. Maybe you can implement some other uh, some other um, some other policies, other measures that protect uh, the U.S. industry, the U.S. intellectual uh, intellectual property. Uh, but apparently, tariffs is not. The, um, the the instrument that you should implement. To sum up, are tariffs the best solutions to this, these four problems mentioned by Donald Trump? Of course, no. Number one, huge US trade deficit. Here, the, the problem is the capital account surplus. And this is a direct consequence of, you know, a simple accounting of the balance, uh, of, the balance of payments. Nothing more than this. Of course, this is something that you should be concerned about, but as long as there is demand for your US dollar denominated assets, you cannot do more, uh, a lot to, to, to fight this. The only way you can fight this is simply to reduce your capital account surplus, which would mean that you are you know, getting rid of your senior rush uh, uh, position and you are uh, simply withdrawing the US dollar from the international exchange and the inter international financial market. Number two, enormous and increasing inequalities in income. Once again, tariffs is not the solution for this problem. This is caused by skill-based technical change and the automation of work and the fact that different skills are either complements or substitutes to uh, capital, to machines, to, I, to AI, to you know, all of those, uh, those technological uh, progresses that are implemented in the firms. This is something natural. Unfortunately, this is a very big problem from the labor market point of view, and uh, there is a huge research done in this uh, particular uh, in this particular uh, subject. To some extent, trade accelerates this process because, as you know from the Ricardian trade theory, trade um, the, um, yeah. Things like this also happen to everyone, uh, to me as especially. Uh, knowing from the Ricardian trade theory and the Heckscher Olin model, um, you know that uh, country in which which factors in which the country is abundant, relatively abundant, are winning from international trade. So in this case, the, the, the factors which are complements to technological change, the high skill workers, the high skills. 
So, uh, but what can you do? What can you do? You can stop uh, technological change. Maybe this is the best solution to do it and uh, or, or uh, uh, to slow down the technological change by closing the country to international trade. But this is really pointless and this is a strategy that nobody wants to implement and this is really missing, missing the point. Number three, collapse of US heavy industry trade and uh, manufacturing. Once again, this sector has no compar uh, a comparative advantage and uh, in the US and the US has a comparative advantage in other high tech high tech uh, sectors that is why this sector is unfortunately to some extent doomed uh, in the long run because uh, well why you should uh, support things that are not productive in the international scale in the covid-19 case there are arguments for supporting this type these types of sectors in which you don't have comparative advantage Maybe we will talk about this in the in the third part of the lecture today. I will mention it right now. Well, it's only due to the fact that the international supply chains are broken in the in the case of COVID-19, which means that the big problem big problem is that in some countries you don't have several segments of of, of uh, industry of, of of manufacturing. For example, there was a huge problem with very simple masks uh, producing very simple masks just after the the, the crisis went out. Um, many countries had to import those masks from China because China is the only producer of those of those uh, things. The same with the medical equipment. Therefore, sometimes, possibly, it's good to rethink the idea of comparative advantage and to reduce the risk of relying on international supply chains, which are subject to being broken, for example, when the pandemic hits the economy, right? But this is a totally different different story. In general, you should not you should not uh, support those things which are not uh, competitive. They are not uh, um, uh, they are not efficient, right? Because this is in general not efficient. And then the final argument: ongoing business stealing and the leakage of the U.S. high tech achievements, mainly to China. I'm not an expert on this. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I imagine there are ways of of solving this problem with you know. Uh, fixing the patent, uh, the patent uh, office, patent scheme, or you know, having some other uh, agreements with China, paying uh, that China pays more for the technology or using the technology, things like this. By the way, China has not invented business stealing. Business stealing has been present uh, in the past as well, so it's not a new problem. And there are plenty of solutions uh, which are not tariffs to solve this particular problem, right? Okay, so now the question is what our very simple uh, um, theory can tell us about the, the first round effect of the economic implications of implementing tariffs. To discuss this, let us assume a super simple model of, model of uh, I know, TV, supply and demand. So there is a domestic demand curve, which is downward sloping, a domestic supply curve for TV sets, uh, which is upward sloping. On the y-axis, you have the price of a TV, and on the x-axis, you have the quantity of TV. You know, standard microeconomics uh, model, in fact, comes from one of the uh, nice uh, textbooks from by Krugman and Wells. So what do we have here? So let's uh, analyze first the initial equilibrium, E1, which is the crossing of the demand and supply curves, with the price PA and QA. Why QA and PA? Well, because we are in an autarky situation, when there is no international trade. This means autarky. So A is for autarky. So you have the autarky price of TVs and autarky quantity of prices, uh, uh, quantity of, uh, of TV sets bought by individuals and produced domestically. So QA is both the production of the country and the consumption in the country. You remember we had the same analysis in the specific factors model last week. What is important here in this very simple E1 situation, so the autarky equilibrium, is the W, so this triangle here, is the consumer surplus. What is the consumer surplus? It's simply the gain that consumers get due to the fact that uh, exactly QA units of TV sets are produced and sold on the market for the price PA. Hmm? If, the, if the quantity of goods was lower than QA, of course the price would be higher and the, uh, the surplus, the consumer surplus would be way smaller. All right? So this is something that consumers are winning to a situation in which the price is higher. Okay, so this is the autarky equilibrium E1. 
Now what we are doing in this very simple system is we are opening our TV sector into international trade. So what we are doing is, first of all, of all we are lower, lowering the price of, uh, of TV sets to PW. Why? Because the quantity of TV sets that are available on the, uh, on the market is now larger than the quantity that is only produced in the home country. All right? So E2 is the new equilibrium in the, uh, in the, in the market of TV sets. So the price went from PA to PW, uh, the quantity um, available for consumers went up from QA, the outer key quantity, to the uh, new uh, quantity available, um, um, fulfilled, uh, that, that is fulfilling the demand of, of individuals. But at the same time, the lower price means that the quantity of TV sets produced at home is now way lower. It's QT. All right? And the difference between what you consume and what you produce at home is, of course, the, the amount of uh, the number of TV sets that you have to import from the foreign country. So you see three things that are happening, uh, three things that are happening here in this graph. First of all, the consumer surplus is now increasing substantially in the new equilibrium. It's the sum of W, X, and double Z triangles. All right? So this is what we see here. Second, the producer surplus, which was the area, uh, in fact, I should have mentioned this, which was the area below the price level. Initial, in the initial equilibrium, it was X plus Y. In the new equilibrium, it's only Y. And in fact, the producer surplus, as you know, uh, producer surplus, as you know it from your micro class, this is simply the fact that there are people who want to buy more than uh, what, you, uh, what you would supply. So the fact that, that the price uh, with a lower supply level would be still lower. Okay, this is, this is the, the cause of the fact that producers would like to uh, supply as much as uh, uh, possible to increase the price level. But with, uh, with uh, opening up the trade, of course, producers in the particular sector are losing due to the fact that the equilibrium price goes down, the world price goes down. But the overall gain from opening trade is this, are those two Z triangles that we can see here. All right? This is the difference between the increase in consumer surplus and the decrease in producer surplus. But there is, once again, a redistribution among consumers and firms in terms of gains and losses. The winners are consumers, they gain the Z, the additional consumer surplus, the losers are domestic firms and the employers of those domestic firms in this particular sector because they are losing the quantity X, right, or the value X, right, the, the producer uh, surplus, the part of producer surplus. But in general, in overall, the, in total, opening up to trade is beneficial. So as you say it in the economic jar economics jargon, the pie increases. But how you divide the pie is something completely different. This is a, uh, an, um, an, a conclusion very similar to what we had in the specific factors model. We know that the pie is increasing, that there are gains from trade, but who wins and who loses from trade? Uh, this is shaky, right? You might, uh, you might implement a redistribution policy in, uh, to make everyone better off in this particular situation. Whether or not everyone is better off from international trade, it's not clear, and it's actually not the case uh, always, right? Fair enough. So we have our simple model. So now let's try to uh, see what happens when you implement tariffs in this very simple uh, one-sector model. So we move now from the equilibrium E2, which was the, the previous open, open economy equilibrium, and we have that the government is increasing tariffs, which simply means the price for consumers is moving now from the world price of the good to the tariff price of the good, which is larger, okay? So the new equilibrium quantity of uh, domestic consumption is going to be in point E3. And as you can see, some things are still happening in the economy. So we have higher prices uh, and lower quantities consumed of the, of the good, okay? Prices go up, quantities go down, but the production of the domestic producers goes up. Fair enough, because the prices are now higher, so the market price is higher, which means that producers are willing to produce larger amount of the good. Fair enough. But what do we have in total? Consumer surplus decreases by the area A, B, C, and D. So this 
this particular uh, part uh, is the reduction in uh, the consumer consumer's surplus. But then, of course, the producer's surplus goes up. This is this area A, which is below the price, the market price, but above the supply curve. Fair enough. There is still one more interesting part of this diagram. That is this location C, which is actually the government's revenue from implementing tariffs. The new um, imports to the country is the difference between C2 and Q2. It goes down from C1 minus Q2, Q1, sorry. It's now equal to C2 minus Q2. But this is still the value, the, the number of TVs that are imported to the country, right? And the, what's the revenue? What's the tariff per unit of TV, it's of course the difference in prices, PT minus PW, which means that the product of this value times this value is actually the revenue that is generated by tariffs, which goes to the, uh, to the government um, of the country. And apparently this is this rectangle C. And this is something that stays, at, you know, stays in the country and can be redistributed, for example, among consumers, uh, to reduce the, the effects of, uh, of uh, a loss in, in the consumer surplus. But all in all, areas B and D are net economic losses due to tariffs, are not compensated for the consumers. You remember that the total loss was A, B, C, O, D, and D. The gain for firms is A. The gain for the government is C. Well, but the total loss is B plus D. This is not compensated, and this is a total loss from implementing tariffs. Conclusion, the total pie in the economy reduces when uh, you uh, increase tariffs. Consumers lose heavily, producers win significantly, the government slightly wins, the, the government can redistribute this, but this redistribution will certainly not compensate all the losses of the consumers. Plus, there is also a distributive effect that producers are winning and consumers are, by definition, losing. So this is what our simple theory will tell us about the consequences of implementing tariffs. Fair enough. Of course, this is super simple, but it gives you a, a general perception of whether or not implementing tariffs is good for the economy or not. Now the question is, what's the reality? And in terms of reality, we need to turn to some serious research uh, results published in uh, already, I think this paper actually is published in American Economic Review, here I'm citing a previous version of this paper. The impact of the 2018 trade war on US prices and welfare. Okay, so what the researchers uh, find in their uh, research. They find that the costs of new tariff structure were largely passed through and as increase, increases in US prices, affecting domestic consumers and producers who buy imported goods rather than foreign exporters. What does it mean? It simply means that the previously low price was increased in the sectors in which there were tariffs imposed or highly exposed to, to tariff, uh, tariff intensive uh, goods. And this increase in prices was totally passed through to consumers as we have here in, the, in this diagram. That actually the, what firms producers do in those sectors did in those sectors is that they simply increased the prices a, and they didn't, didn't care because why? First of all, the inputs were higher, uh, they were more, uh, more expensive. Secondly, they could do it because uh, now the equilibrium price is high. Then the researchers estimate that the tariffs reduced real income, income by about $17 billion per year. And this is a pure loss from, the total, uh, from implementing tariffs um, in uh, one year. This is... 0.1% uh, of US GDP. You might think it's, it's, not a big, it's not a big share of US GDP, but still it's 17 billion year, which is a pure loss from you know, a policy that is, that is uh, ill-motivated. In fact, this is the, the surface B plus D we had in our previous graph. This is the total loss, net economic loss due to the tariff. It's estimated in the beginning of 2019, it was estimated at 17 billion dollars per year. Whether or not there are new estimates, look at the literature, maybe there are some new numbers, maybe it's smaller, maybe larger, but the magnitude, the order of magnitude here is 0.1% of US GDP. This is a pure loss from this policy. Due to re reduced foreign competition, domestic producers' prices also increased, which means that even sectors which were not exposed to the tariffs also 
increased prices because why not? They uh, they managed to you know to to pass through uh, intermediate costs of production uh, to consumers. And finally, the prices of manufactured goods rose by one percentage point relative to a no trade war scenario. So all the manufacturing goods, uh, manufactured goods uh, that are produced in the U.S., their prices went up by one percentage point. You know, which is considering that the inflation rate in the U.S. is around two percent. This is a huge increase, uh, only due to the fact that you have, uh, you know, an ill a policy that is implemented on uh, the costs of of uh, imports. Fair enough. If you don't like this paper, let's take another one. The Returns to Protectionism, NBR working paper uh, from 2008. This paper I'm not, I, I don't remember in which uh, in which journal it is it is um, it is published uh, actually. But uh, you know, looking at the names, I'm pretty sure it's it's relatively high. So what those guys find? They find that tariffs reduce U.S. imports uh, in a, in those particular uh, industries by 32 percent and retaliatory tariffs. From other countries, caused a 11% decline of U.S. exports. What's the retaliatory tariff? It's simply the fact that, of course, the China is not, a, you know, a sucker, and they are also, uh, you know, answering the U.S. when they are when U.S. is increasing the tariffs to China. China is, of course, also increasing tariffs, right? And apparently, uh, what is what we are uh, left with is uh, a, a, a decrease in bilateral trade uh, trade uh, exchange. And apparently, uh, since the U.S. had a uh, trade deficit with almost all the partners, this increases, it decreases the imports more than it decreases exports. So the, you know, in this particular sector, the trade balance is improving. But at what cost? Well, they estimate consumers' welfare, welfare loss of almost $70 billion, which was substantially offset by the income gains to U.S. Producer, producers, $61 billion. You remember the producer surplus gain and the consumer surplus loss. Yeah? In total, they report a real income decline about $8 billion per year, a number which is slightly twice, uh, you know, 50% lower than what, what the previous paper uh, estimates. Okay, fair enough. Now, two interesting facts. The first of all, the guys, uh, the researchers estimate that countries, counties, sorry, counties, so the local uh, local regions in the US with at least 85% of Republican vote share bore losses over 50% greater than counties in which the Republican vote share was less than 50%. So how hilarious is this? It means that those regions which are very Republican intensive, they are voting heavily for Donald Trump, on average those regions lost over 50% more than those regions which are very democratic oriented. And we go back to this backfire of the US trade tariffs, which apparently is, is the case. So you see how ridiculous the situation is. Um, the industries and the regions which believed that the tariffs is, uh, you know, the, is something that will help them in economic prosperity and well-being, is actually uh, are actually harmed more than all the other regions in the U.S. Sad, but true. And the final uh, thing is that to put this number eight billion dollar loss uh, in perspective, the researchers um, note that China is actually paying eight billion of dollars in royalties for the U.S. intellectual property in 2017. A substantial increase in royalty payments could offset part of this welfare loss. Which means that actually, what the U.S. is uh, was, is losing due to tariffs is uh, could be repaid by China by you know some other type of economic agreement of using the intellectual property, and this relates back to the point number four in terms of the business stealing, uh, solving the business stealing problem. There are different ways of solving this problem. Tariffs are not the way of solving this problem. Simply, you know, write down a deal with with the U.S. company, U.S. companies and the Chinese companies by you know paying for for intellectual property. This would first of all offset all the uh, all the losses that are brought about by the by the tariffs, and secondly, this would not you know um, reduce uh, the GDP in general uh, all over the world and you know push the economies into the into the recession. Okay, so of course. Um, 
Whether or not implementing tariffs is a good or, or bad strategy, politically speaking, is something similar to the Brexit strategy, right? Uh, well, people sometimes uh, don't don't care about about the economic consequences. They want the political consequence to uh, to appear. With Brexit, the situation is exactly the same. Everyone knows that the UK will heavily lose on Brexit, but still they voted for it. Everyone knew that Trump is proposing things that are not good for the US economy. Trade tariffs, building the wall on the US-Mexican border, conflicting with uh, you know transatlantic partners and Japan. Everyone knows this is this is bad, but people are so frustrated at some point that you know they are voting for such ridiculous uh, strategies only to show that the country they they are living in is strong and you know you know they are in this particular context making us uh, america great again but this is nationalism this is counter economic development this is uh, something that um shows us that capitalism in this form as we have it right now is something that has to be fixed why because of those inequalities that are out there that they are generating those frustrations which are generating voting for populists and are generating nationalism and anti-globalization movements this is i think our role as economists to try to think about ways of fixing capitalism but apparently um, since we don't have any any idea how to do this at least in the short term the guys who are uh, proposing policies like this, like uh, Donald Trump, like uh, uh, Nigel Farage with the Brexit, with uh, with the Italian government uh, some time ago, with uh, Hungarian government, with my Polish government in my home country, people like this are, are winning a lot. And uh, this is only due to people's frustration in general. Which means we, ha we have to learn economics and we have to learn how to solve problems. Apparently, tariffs is not a solution to the problems that were mentioned by Donald Trump. And we know this, but, we, uh, but still, um, yeah, we need to try to, to find solutions on the other sides of the, of the economic reality, like labor markets, inequality and uh, fairness. All right, so this will be the end of the second part of the, of the lecture. After the break, we move to the part number three. So see you after the break.